This man is about to die. In a few moments, he'll be led to a public square bound to a stake and burned to death as a heretic. The year is 1755. The place, Lisbon, Portugal. Thousands bear witness. They've been told this man is Satan's servant. What they don't know is that they are doomed, fated to be victims of a triple disaster. Earthquake, tsunami, firestorm. A catastrophe of biblical proportions that will bring an empire to its knees and shake the faith of many who believe in God. This is the story of one of history's perfect storms. <laughs> Lisbon, capital city of Portugal, and one of the oldest cities in Europe, its founding predates London, Paris, and even Rome. But today, remnants of its ancient glories are hard to find. This is the Baixa, the low-lying area of Lisbon. Most of Lisbon's population lived here. Most of its churches could be found here completely destroyed. Three hundred years ago, a very different Lisbon stood on this site. A gilded city at the center of a world empire until the day disaster struck. November 1st, 1755. This is Daniel Braddock, foreign resident of Lisbon. He will write an account of these terrible events which will horrify the rest of Europe. The time is 9.30 a.m. Braddock is in his apartment, writing letters. Braddock was one of the many British merchants uh, to be found in Lisbon in 1755. There was a large colony of them there, Protestants uh, in a very Catholic city. He starts to realize that something unusual is going on when his desk and the papers in front of him begin to shake and tremble. Braddock is experiencing the first surge of an approaching earthquake known as the P or primary wave. It's a high frequency wave, which means that the ground moves very fast. And basically what you, feel, what you would feel is like something like that. So it would shake the water inside your cup. Just moments later, the S, or secondary wave, reaches Lisbon. Actually, the amplitude is a little bit higher, so it would shake you a little bit more. You would feel it like a truck, a truck that is, is passing. The sound gets louder and louder, like thunder. And then he realizes this must be an earthquake. And even though he realizes it's an earthquake, he doesn't know what to do. I guess it's normal, but he, he freezes at that very moment. November 1st is All Saints Day, one of the most important feasts in the Catholic calendar. and tens of thousands of worshipers are celebrating mass in stone vaulted churches, soon to become their death traps. In Lisbon, there were some 40 parish churches. There were 90 convents, 130 oratories. So the place was absolutely kind of dripping with piety. 
Lisbon was just about as close to a, an earthly city of God as any European capital could have been. And it seemed, it seemed the last place that where, where God's wrath would be, would be unleashed. Foreigners like Daniel Braddock are in Lisbon, not for its piety, but because this is where money is to be made. Lisbon is booming. Rivers of gold and diamonds flood the king's treasury from mines in faraway Brazil. It's said the king has more gold than all the other princes of Europe combined. And much of it goes to the church. We're in the Lisbon church of Sao Roque. Now, in the early 18th century, King João V decided that what the church needed was a chapel dedicated to St. John the Baptist. He told the architects to spare absolutely no expense. They took him at his word. Look at the splendor here. Look what the gold of Brazil and the West African slave trade, look what it could buy. Behind the splendor, there is a dark side to the power of the church. The Inquisition, a centuries-old tool of terror used to root out heretics and protect the Catholic faith. This is the Rocio Square in Lisbon. This is the center of the Portuguese Inquisition. The entire populace would come out into the city to see the condemned processed through the streets and then killed in the Rocio. Large stakes would be planted into the ground, and on top, the condemned would be tied to that stake, and a large bonfire would be started underneath them. Today, the registers of the Inquisition are kept here at the National Archives in Lisbon. A meticulous record keeping of centuries of religious persecution. This is a trial document of a man named Jacques Viegas. He's a 20 year old bachelor, he was a slave, and he was accused of witchcraft and sorcery. And as part of the evidence against him, they've included this little tiny sack that includes so-called demonic seeds. It looked suspicious. It looked like he was a witch, a sorcerer. Others were accused of performing satanic rites for selling their souls to the devil and celebrating the Black Mass. Not one accused heretic could expect mercy from the Grand Inquisitor. Declaração o Reu Antonio José da Silva por convicto negativo. The prisoner was convicted negatively of the crime of heresy. And then he was sentenced to excommunication. After this, was given over to the secular authorities who condemned him to death. <laughs> Most of the time, death was not quick. If there was a stiff wind like there is today, it would take sometimes hours for the condemned to be burned at the stake. <laughs> Writhing there in front of thousands, the king, the queen, men, women, and children, bishops, all of Portuguese society would see them suffer. While heretics burn, 150 miles off the coast of Portugal, the power that will cause Lisbon's destruction is about to be unleashed. Not from God in heaven, but forces deep beneath the Earth's surface. This is a fault line, 
the meeting point of two gigantic tectonic plates and a ticking seismological time bomb. Susanna Villanova is a researcher specializing in seismic hazards. This earthquake is occurred in a, a place that no one would suspect that you could have such a big earthquake. It's very big. It's considered to be a great earthquake. Moments before 9.30 a.m. on November 1st, 1755, a sudden sliding movement between two plates occurs. If this is the surface, then you have a movement like that. The vertical movement should be something like 10 meters. The result? A massive magnitude 8.5 earthquake, one of the most powerful in modern European history. Hundred fifty miles from the epicenter. As the full power of the earthquake strikes Lisbon, Daniel Braddock is paralyzed by fear. Today, scientists recognize this behavior as a natural evolutionary response. Your brain undergoes a sort of metamorphosis in a life or death event. Your amygdala takes over, which is the part of your brain that's a very primitive part of the brain that handles fear. And the more frightened you are, the more powerful the amygdala becomes. You are no longer using the normal, higher executive functions of your brain, at least they're kind of suppressed. The amygdala tends to lead to reactions like paralysis in some extreme cases, shutting down altogether in high fear situations. the earthquake is big enough, it's actually impossible to, to stand up. So you are, you'll be thrown back and forth. Utter chaos surrounds Daniel Braddock. All around him, the house seems to fall inward, rafters falling, bricks and mortar fall upon his head, and then a huge cloud of dust goes up in the air and the whole city becomes what he describes as an Egyptian darkness. It seems as if it is night. In 2004, Portuguese archeologists, led by Professor Miguel Antunes, made a horrifying discovery a mass grave hidden beneath the cloisters of an old Lisbon convent. We found remnants from all classes, all ages, all sexes. We can estimate, estimate, this is a gross estimate, that in the whole cloister, there would be remnants of about 3,000 people. And this is only a part of those who were killed at this great earthquake. The casualties of one of history's perfect storms, each one of these bones tells its own tale of terror. We can interpret this as a wall that fell down and elements it a person in the head with this result. This is enough to kill. Nobody knows exactly how many people were crushed in those first terrifying moments. But time and place would conspire to seal the fate of tens of thousands. You can imagine this church full on All Saints' Day, the 1st of November, 1755, the pews full, the whole extent of this nave full of people. All Saints' Day was, was an extraordinarily important feast in the Christian calendar. You would find the aristocrats and the noble classes would be in the first pews. 
At the rear of the church, one would have found slightly more humble class of people. When they were in the middle of the mass, suddenly the entire church began to shake violently. Candles came down, columns were, were moving. There was complete and utter panic. People did not really understand what was happening. It was absolute and utter chaos. For many people, what had been written in the book of Revelations was coming to pass. Pieces of stone were falling on the people. Timber from the roof was falling on people. People were screaming. They believe that it was sent by God. It was a special day, and therefore it was a special punishment. Daniel Braddock has miraculously survived. Of course, a few minutes before, Lisbon was in festival mode. People were walking through the streets to the 10 o'clock mass, and now Lisbon was essentially an apocalyptic scene. One eyewitness said that it was hard to walk without stepping on a dead body. There were thousands of people inside the rubble, so entombed, screaming for someone to help them. And then others stumbled out of the ruins in much worse shape than Braddock. Their heads crushed, their arms or legs broken, crying out for someone to help them. It was a scene from Dante's Inferno. Rubble is still falling down. Homes are collapsing into the streets. As the city crumbles around him, Braddock encounters a mother and her child, desperate for help. This is a skull from a very young person that was found with this small bit of stone that has a sort of point. It was in this position. They burst the frontal bone and was enough to kill because he penetrated into the brain. Boulder Falls crushes her. They die. In moments of extreme emotional distress, disaster victims can experience something called dissociation. People often feel a sort of detachment from what they're seeing. It feels surreal. The technical term for this is dissociation, where people feel like maybe they're watching it from a distance. This is the brain's way of helping you, because you need to get out of that situation. You don't need to linger there and ponder the ramifications of what you're seeing. But for Daniel Braddock, the horrors have only begun. Because after the earthquake comes the tsunami. Lisbon, Portugal, Saturday morning, November 1st, 1755. Six minutes after a magnitude 8.5 earthquake strikes, the capital of the Portuguese empire is brought to its knees.
thousands of survivors, including British merchant Daniel Braddock, flee towards what they hope will be safety. Open ground down by the Tagus River. In the minutes after the earthquake had ended, this square became a great place of chaos. This great imperial city was, for the most part, destroyed. But for many of those who came to this square to find succor, this was only the beginning. Other horrors would await them. 150 miles offshore, the earthquake has displaced trillions of gallons of water. It results in a tsunami, which takes less than 40 minutes to reach Lisbon. No one had any idea that a tsunami would follow an earthquake. They, they had no, no experience, uh, as we do today. Unaware that death is advancing from the sea, the city survivors cling desperately to their faith in God. In the immediate aftermath of the quake, the streets were full of people, you know, clutching crucifixes and repenting. And, they, and there were large uh, numbers of the clergy telling them to repent and reminding them, if they needed any reminding, that this disaster had been delivered upon Lisbon on account of their sins. One of the most intriguing patterns that you see in many disasters is that even if they're strangers, you will see people come together, share information, exchange theories. Sometimes there's a tendency to sort of feel overwhelming sense of victimization. Why is this happening to me? How could this be happening? That is not as productive, right? Because it is paralyzing. It's a negative cycle that makes it very hard to disrupt that cycle and to think through a plan of action, which is really what you need to do. The tsunami is a massive wall of water that can travel at speeds of up to 600 miles per hour. And as it approaches the shoreline, it will crest at the height of a two-story building. It was this moment that Braddock hears that the sea is coming in. He looks towards the Tagus River, and he sees a mountain of water, frothing water, moving towards him. There was really no safe ground, no place to run. In seconds, the wave hits Braddock. The waves crash in upon him. He has no time to flee. He grabs a beam in front of him as the waters rush by. He was one of the lucky ones. By holding on to this beam, he survived. But thousands were actually pulled out into the ocean. One ship captain, about 10 days later, saw out in, in the Atlantic Ocean an enormous pile of bodies and furniture. He learned later were from Lisbon. The tsunami kills hundreds, but the waters recede and are not enough to extinguish the gathering flames of a new nightmare. In a cruel twist of fate, just before the earthquake strikes, thousands of candles are lit in Lisbon to celebrate the Feast of All Saints. As soon as everything came crashing down, well, the virus broke out. You could see plumes of smoke rising in hundreds of places across the city. As night falls and the wind picks up, the flames begin to spread and merge. It 
it's a process that scientists can replicate in the laboratory. When individual pans of ethanol are lit, they leap on the wind from one pan to the next, wherever they can find a new source of fuel. This is typical of a mass fire where you have multiple individual fuel packages. As the columns merge, they'll begin to induce their own wind. The flame may spread up a hill or laterally out. That is one way that a series of small fire plumes might merge into a large column. This phenomenon was observed in Lisbon as recently as 1988. A fire that starts from a single source in the back room of a warehouse rips through the heart of the city. This fire was really very strong, from extreme violence, and that was lived here a real inferno, and we had here centuries of bombs to fire. This fire was raging out of control. The blaze destroys 300 homes kills two people and injures more than 60 firefighters. Ainda hoje, hoje quando penso nele e que as imagens que eu vi e vivi, ainda hoje me arrepio até neste momento um bocado arrepiado só de, de pensar nisso. It's a terrifying replay of what happened in Lisbon 250 years earlier, following the 1755 earthquake. House by house, street by street, the flames spread, merge, and engulf the city. This fire, of course, it was really hundreds of fires in the hours after the earthquake. After they coalesced, they became one large conflagration. And now Daniel Braddock finds himself trapped within the inferno, desperate to find a way out. Midnight in Lisbon, November 2nd, 1755. After earthquake and tsunami, fires now wreak destruction on the city. This is a extraordinary handwritten document. O vento, the wind, which was rigoroso, was rigorous, strong, and violent. It's my theory that the Great Fire of Lisbon became a firestorm. Lisbon has the perfect topography for such a unique kind of blaze. Right there is the Rocio Square, the center of the Inquisition. And then behind it, the Tejero do Paso. Between, we find the Baixa. This is the low-lying area the center of the city. It's essentially a bowl. Bounded on three sides by steep hills, the fire can suck in air from just one direction. The result, a self-sustaining wind system that is the unique signature of the firestorm. For those unable to escape, it was as if all the fires of hell had been unleashed on Lisbon. We can ascertain that temperatures exceeded a thousand degrees. Now the fire is it is something you see, for instance, that the end of this part of bones should match here, and they do not. If skull was in perfect state, it would be continuous. It's not anymore, because it's deformed by fire. Now it's been forced, <laughs> and then. Subjected to intense heat, gases in the brain expand splintering the skull along the sutures or seams of the bone until it bursts. It's a sort of explosion. Matter that was inside 
the brain and all other tissues liberated gases and the high temperature. And so the result is that. In a mere 12 hours, Lisbon, one of Europe's richest seaports, has been transformed. No more a city of gold. It has become a repository of charred and blackened bones. And Daniel Braddock, no longer a merchant on the make, has become a refugee fleeing the city. Well, after surviving this tsunami, he's drenched, soaking wet, and he has nothing with him but his nightgown. And he spends that first night shivering in that nightgown with thousands of others. And once these survivors turned back towards the city, they saw it ablaze, one large, hellacious blaze. This eyewitness account gives us a really vivid sense of what happened in the hours after the disaster. A grande quantidade de malfeitores, a great quantity of malefactors who descended upon the Cidade Baixa, the lower part of the city, after they had escaped from the caldeias, or the prisons of the city. In the immediate aftermath of the disaster, there were gangs all over the city. Criminals spilled out of two of the principal prisons where breaches had opened up in the, in the prison walls and they streamed out and they, and they proceeded to fan out over the city and to loot from palaces and churches, anything that they could get their hands on. It's absolutely apocalyptic. Hundreds of thieves, vagabonds, and malefactors descending upon the Sidaji Baisha, the center of the city, like ravening wolves. After earthquake, tsunami, and fire, the perfect storm is not yet done with Lisbon. Survivors face a post-apocalyptic nightmare where anarchy reigns. One of the impulses of many people during that first night and the next day was to go back into the city and see if they could salvage something from their home. Some money perhaps they had in a chest. But this become very dangerous. Braddock reports that there was rape, not just thievery, but murder. There were several causes of death. Death by accident, and certainly fire. And the third, and very important cause too, was slaying. In a, a time of energy, of complete energy. This is a female skull that has been attacked. Has been attacked first by some small cuts with a knife on the skin of the head, probably to terrorize the person. And after they killed her through a shot. In a matter of hours, in November 1755, Lisbon, one of Europe's richest cities, has vanished into dust and smoke. People were really stumbling around, looking and not quite sure where they were. One of the, the British survivors signed off uh, on, a, on a letter after the, after the disaster saying, from the place that was Lisbon, but no longer is. And, and that was very much true. People had the feeling that Lisbon had, had completely uh, disappeared. A landscape painting of the city as it once stood 
is now a catalog of what was lost. So up here is Santa Catarina, which collapsed during the earthquake. And this is the Igreja de São Paulo, completely devastated by the fire. And this building here was the palace of the Dukes of Braganza, completely destroyed by the fire and the earthquake. This is the Paso da Ribeira, the royal palace. Its destruction by the fire was a, a European catastrophe. It was a cultural disaster that rivaled the destruction of the Library of Alexandria. It was a bit funny, some of the things that, that did survive. A number of brothels and, uh, in, in, the, in one part of town were, were still standing, and people thought that was an odd uh, piece of you know, divine intervention, wasn't it? <laughs> the brothels survived and the church, churches collapsed. Within the rubble, lie the ruins of civilized society. There is now no shelter, no safety, no food. And for those desperate to survive, no taboos. What we are seeing is a red femur of a person that shows a series of parallel cut marks with a knife. There was cannibalism. When one wants to get meat from the leg, is just uh, the better part is uh, the, of the leg is that around the femur, as we are seeing here. There are some specimens. This is not unique. What points out that cannibalism was, uh, if not uh, very common, at last, it happened often. It falls to the Marquis of Pumbao, the king's most trusted lieutenant, to save Lisbon from itself, replacing one reign of terror with another. The first thing that Pumbao did was to call in the military to descend upon the city. They built a whole series of new gallows, and they were ordered to build the gallows particularly tall <laughs> so that everybody could see them and that the significance of those gallows wasn't lost on anyone. Anyone caught looting was submitted to very swift justice indeed. He becomes essentially the dictator of the country. He's the man that delivers finally order to Lisbon. But in being a dictator, he was also a despot. And it was under the dictatorship of Pumbao that the flames of the Inquisition would be lit one last time. <laughs> Pumbao's vision was for a new Lisbon built on the rational principles of the Enlightenment. We are in the Baixa Quarter, in the center of Lisbon. This was the area that was most thoroughly devastated during the Great Lisbon Earthquake. And in its aftermath, it was rebuilt in a rational, revolutionary plan with very formal straight streets and side streets, creating this great barrio that 250 years later is still one of the most emblematic barrios in Lisbon. Just as the ramshackle medieval city had gone for good, so had the old ways of thinking. It was not only churches that collapsed in the wake of the disaster. Many saw their religious beliefs destroyed. The debate was about nothing less than the relationship between God and man. They said, if divine wrath was delivered on All Saints' Day at 9.30 in the morning, when most of the population of the city was at mass, what did, what did that mean? Tens of thousands of people died going to church, in church. What, what did that say about a good and just God? You know, not very much. In response to the disaster, the philosopher Voltaire 
would write a best-selling novel called Candide. Like Daniel Braddock, the hero of the novel survives the Lisbon quake and lives to question the old certainties of a God-driven universe. The Lisbon quake was a watershed event for European history because it was really the first time that people began to question the nature and the causes of that kind of disaster. Uh, hitherto, people had, had really regarded any disaster as, as divine will, as the wrath of God, uh, being unleashed uh, on account of, of any number of sins. Uh, but with the Lisbon earthquake, it was the first time that people began to, to contemplate the possibility that it was a disaster caused by, by natural events. For Voltaire's contemporaries, it was the sheer scale of the disaster that was truly shocking. All told, perhaps 30,000 people died in Lisbon during the earthquake, 15% of the population. That kind of physical destruction had not occurred in any place in Europe since the destruction of Pompeii. Uh, there had never been an event like that. Some estimate Portugal lost half its annual revenue as a result of this disaster. Lisbon lost its place at the center of world commerce. And never again would the excesses of the Chapel of Sorok be repeated. For British merchant Daniel Braddock, the losses were incalculable. Of course, Braddock had survived. He lived to tell the tale. He had survived an earthquake, a tsunami, the fires, the thieves, the looters. But he had lost everything. The only thing he had, essentially, was the shirt on his back. Among the victims, one of the most notable had been the Grand Inquisitor, in post-disaster Lisbon, there would be no place for his old superstitions. And Pumbao would sweep away the excesses of the Inquisition. But not before he himself had authorized one last burning. The victim, not a heretic, but one of his political enemies, who was, ironically, a Catholic priest. For 200 years and more, the Portuguese had plied these ocean waves in the name of God, glory, and gold, building an empire that stretched across the globe. But neither their God nor their gold could save them when the day of reckoning came, when the earth began to heave and the seas began to rise and fires consumed their city. Lisbon, 1755, a perfect storm that changed the course of history.